Who do you say Jesus was? I have no idea. Who was Jesus? Gosh, I have to start with, I'm not sure. Who was Jesus to you? Some guy. Actually, I don't believe in Jesus. Not really sure exactly who Jesus was. I think Jesus was, uh, was a was kind of a cool guy back in his day. Who was Jesus to you? <laughs> I think I'm done. I don't like to talk about it. I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not religious. Who do you think Jesus was, or is? Uh, Jesus was a historical figure. I believe that Jesus Christ was a man who had an extraordinary ability to link in with the Creator. I think he was uh, definitely someone that people you know, a good role model. I, I do think he had a lot of great ideas. More or less, he was just a prophet, which is just a messenger of God. Sort of a revolutionary in his day. Jesus was an amazing man. I don't believe he's God's son. I just believe he's a person. As to his, like, God-like quality, I'm not totally sold on that. You think he was a prophet? I would, see, I'd have to be Christian to really believe that. Jesus was the Messiah for some people and for some people he wasn't. I'm not necessarily sure if Jesus was the Messiah or a prophet, but in either case he was somebody that spoke the word of God. He was equal portions of of human and uh, and that energy that is God. People said he was sent by God. Well no one, God doesn't send him down. You don't go on up. <laughs> I mean you he linked in. I mean, I do believe in Jesus in the sense of like, yeah, I believe in Jesus that I'm, I'm not saying that he, he didn't exist or anything of the sort, but the fact that, um, I mean, I necessarily don't go and uh, pray to Jesus. Who was Jesus? Uh, Jesus is the son of God. Jesus was the son of God. I believe Jesus is the son of God who came to save us all from our sins. Jesus was a savior. Who died for our sins and cleaned us, made us pure enough to enter God's glory. The, um, only way you can get to heaven. Who do you think Jesus is? Um, who do I think he is? I, I don't think it's who he was. I think he still is Jesus, so he's not gone or anything, you know. I guess embodied technically he is, but he's still here. The Jesus story sort of borders on history and myth for me, um, but I don't believe that it could have permeated our culture so fully and for so long if there was nothing to that. Well, all of us have an idea who Jesus is. All of us in here have an idea who Jesus is. Some of us know him. Some of us don't. Some of us have our own Jesus. Jesus we've created, who we think he should be. Yes, yes, we'll dismiss the kids. Thank you for that light, Martha. I have seen the light. Martha showed me the light. <laughs> I'm done. Let's go home. <laughs> all the kids are dismissed. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. <laughs> But all of us have this idea who Jesus is, and a little eight-year-old boy named Danny Dutton of Chola Vista, California, wrote this when asked a homework assignment of who Jesus was. This is from an eight-year-old boy, Danny Dutton. Jesus is God's son. He used to do all the hard work, like walking on water, performing miracles, and trying to teach the people who didn't want to learn about God. <laughs> I thought this was great. They finally got tired of him preaching to them, and they crucified him. But he was good and kind like his father, and he told his father that they didn't know what they were doing and to forgive them. And God said, God, his dad said, okay. His dad, God, appreciated everything that he had done and all his hard work on earth, so he told them that he didn't have to go out on the road anymore. <laughs> he could stay in heaven. So he did. And now he helps his dad out by listening to prayers and seeing things which are important for God to take care of and which ones he can take care of himself without having to bother God. Like a secretary, like a secretary only more important. <laughs> you can pray anytime you want, and they are sure to hear you because they got it worked out, so one of them is on duty all the time. <laughs>
I tell you, children help us understand who God is. <laughs> and several year, years ago, I met with this young man who just happened to stop by the church when I was in Ohio. And he wanted to talk. And so I just sat down and talked with him. And, you know, just listening to his story, I told him that Jesus loved him so much that he went to the cross and he died for them. And, and I remembered his response so visibly. He said, I have never heard of that Jesus before. Really? He had never heard of this Jesus before. This Jesus who, you know, died, you know, who was, you know, born of a virgin, you know, was crucified on the cross and raised from the dead. He had never heard of that Jesus before. And some of you might remember I shared a story this past summer, you know, we did the, the big event we did at the Splash House. And the young ladies around the corner uh, that were you know, in the front desk and, you know, uh, folks, they didn't know Jesus died on the cross. That Jesus, the one who died on, they didn't know that he, they had heard of him and probably would have had similar responses to what, you know, you saw in that video, but they did not know that Jesus died on the cross. We live in Marion, Indiana, come, and I woo, come on, this is Bible's USA here, and they did not know. That Jesus died on a cross for them. Folks, there are still people who live in our area who don't know who Jesus is. They don't even know he died on a cross. They just see the cross on the church. There's people who don't know that. And hopefully that shocks you. Does it shock you? You know, all of us who've been raised in the church, we know the story. We've got it memorized. We've got it. We know it. We've heard it. And, you know, we, we, we try to live it. But there's people who don't know that Jesus died on the cross. Before Jesus, though, came on the scripture that we're looking at today, before all the scripture was written, before Jesus comes on the scene in the New Testament, you know, People were stressed out and worn out trying, stressed out and worn out trying to please God. They were so busy trying to do good in order to be good, they couldn't see how good life was. They were following all these ridiculous laws, which is humanly impossible to do. Boy, if you, they, you know, the, the Pharisees created not only, they had the Ten Commandments, but then the Pharisees created 600 other laws that you had to live by. And they created some ridiculous laws, and they were set up by these religious leaders and to let the people know how well they were doing at pleasing God. That's the only reason why they had this law. People wanted to know how well they were doing and pleasing God. So these wonderful leaders set up all these 600 rules plus the Ten Commandments and said, this is how you know how well you're doing at pleasing God. And and as you could imagine, they couldn't enjoy God because they couldn't quite measure up. Okay, can you keep 600 laws? There is no way on earth you can do that. Even if you could memorize them. There's a Patrick Proks who leads us, uh, led us on our Jamaica trips the last two times. He read a book where this guy followed all of the Old Testament religious laws in 2015. Followed them all. Told his wife, he wrote a book about it, told his wife about it. And one of the things was, you know, you could not sit wherever a woman had her monthly time. And so her wife, his wife, who was a jokester, ran around and sat all in all the furniture. So he had to stand up all the time because he couldn't <laughs> sit out anywhere because he was following all these laws of the Old Testament. And he said, when he wrote the book, he said, it is impossible to do. How can anybody enjoy God trying, you're trying so hard to fulfill all of these laws and trying so hard to perfect these laws in their life? How could they do that? Well, all these were set up to figure out how well they were doing at pleasing God. 
As I said, you, they probably didn't enjoy God very much because they could never measure up. They always needed a little more holiness, and they always needed a few more good deeds, and they always needed a little more of this, a little more of that before God could accept them, and the religious leaders made sure they knew that. Folks, they were basically wearing themselves out. And before Jesus came onto the scene, they saw God as this legislator, as a judge, as a law enforcement, as a law, law enforcer, as a cosmic policeman who was obsessed with keeping his people in line. This is how they saw God if you were there during Jesus' time. And in the midst of all this, in this context, Jesus says this, and it's recorded in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30. He says, come to me. All of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word Thank you, you want to make our life easy. Amen. Now, to put all this in a nutshell, what he was telling them in this verse is that I've come to make your life easier. Does anybody want that? I've come. Raise your hand if you'd like Jesus to make your life easier. Raise your hand. Come on, let's confess. And those of you who don't raise him, and I expect an altar call today. <laughs> all right. Yeah, we all want, you know, he come to make our life easier. And when they heard that, people went, oh, wow. You know, people were sick and tired of failing, of failing, of failing to please God. They could, they, they could never measure up. They, they, they served God and they did all this stuff. And that boy, just doing all this stuff for God, it was hard work. And Jesus comes and said, hey, I've come to give you rest. I've come to give you, make your life a little bit easier. Well, folks, hold on. Here now, you might not agree with this, but if you're if following Jesus for you, if following Jesus is hard work for you, and you feel like you're always failing God, then you're not. You're probably not following Jesus. You're probably not. If you are straining to live a holy life and keep failing. You're probably not following Jesus. If you're constantly worried about your own sin and, or more about everybody else's sin, <laughs> then you're probably not following Jesus. If you're trying hard not to sin, then you're probably not following Jesus. If you're trying hard to be good and to do everything right, then you're probably not following Jesus. Probably not. These are the things that wear us out. These are the things that convince us we are not good enough for God. These are the things that keep us worried. These are the things that burden us down. These are the things that keep us emotionally and mentally exhausted. Am I right? I think so. Because if you are following Jesus, you will find rest. I didn't write it. If you are following Jesus, then you will find rest. There are things that keep us from following Jesus. If, if following Jesus, like I said, isn't making your life easier, well, you're probably not following Jesus. You know, being in a relationship with Christ is not an added burden. Is it, church? Being in a relationship with Christ is not an added burden. If your Christian life is a burden to you, I suggest you quit following him because you're just pretending. But being in a relationship with Christ is not a burden, not an added burden. The, re the reason 
our relationship with Jesus becomes such a burden is because we make the relationship with Jesus about us, don't we? Isn't that why it's a burden? Because we make the relationship with Jesus about us. When, when it's about us, you know, when it's about us, we try, try harder to please God. When it's about us, we work harder for God. We do more for Jesus. We have an extended devotional time or we have an extended prayer. You know, you know, when it's about us, we get busier for God. The more I do for God, the more holy I am. Folks, no. God has never asked us to try harder. God has never asked us to work harder. And God has never asked us to get busier. Folks, you made that up. You in your own heart made that up so we can cover up the insecurities inside because we know we're not following Jesus the way we should follow Jesus. And I don't know how you should follow Jesus, but we get all out of sorts thinking we got to do this, we got to do this, we got to do this in order for this to happen, we got to do this. Boy, God says, stop, stop, stop. It doesn't matter about getting busier. It's not about working harder. It's not about any of that stuff it's about finding rest God has never asked us to try harder work harder or get busier he simply says this verse come to me and find rest and I will make your life easier now a lot of people think when Jesus when Jesus came to make their life easier they think well man he's going to give me the house I need He's going to give me the money I need. He's going to give me the job I need. He's going to give me, he's going to provide all the resources I need to make my life easier. That's not what he meant. That's not what he means by making your life easier. Easier. What's going, what's going to make your life easier is realizing that Jesus is the point, meaning he is all you need. Folks, you will never find rest. You will always be worried. You will always be tense your life if until Jesus becomes all you need. And we will never be at rest. As long as we're carrying the burden of trying to please God by our good deeds, it's it's impossible and it's unnecessary. Jesus was the only one who could do it, and he's already done it, so we need to learn to rest in his completed work. When you enter into that relationship with Jesus, you learn to rest. Meaning, you know there is no way you can be holy without first being in relationship with him. You know there's no way you can meet the requirements of perfection set up by the religious leaders. In fact, sometimes set up by pastors. Forgive us. Some pastors make it, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to follow this game plan in order for God to love you and to grow in your relationship with God and for God to love you more. Do you know when you gave your life to Christ and entered in that relationship, do you know he's not going to love you any more than that day? He already loves you before you get into that relationship. It says now you begin to recognize, wow, God loves me. This is incredible. And I believe that's why those who come out of some hard luck times or, you know, we're really, you know, we know the really big sinners, you know, we see, you know, that come out of drugs and come out of alcohol and come out of that stuff, you know, and they come and, you know, we put them up on stage and they tell their story and we, oh, God really loves him. You know what? God loves you the exact same way. But we have in our mindset this thinking which is a lie from the pit of hell that we got to perform in order for God to love us. And there's some people, and I believe that lie for a long time. We have to perform in order for God, if, you know, and folks, that's just a lie from the pit of hell. And if you believe that, do what Carolina's song just said. Kill it. 
Because he doesn't ask us to perform. He doesn't ask us to work harder. He doesn't ask us to try harder. He doesn't ask us to extend our devotion time. He doesn't ask us to pray longer. He doesn't ask us to do any of those things. We are the ones who've created that. He simply says, what? Come to me and find rest. Because he's all you need. And we know, you know, there's no way you can meet the requirements of perfection. I could give you a list of things to do. You know, it's not going to make you more holy. Folks, Jesus has already met all the requirements. You don't have to. This is why we feel like a failure so much in our walk with Jesus. Have you ever felt like a failure in your walk with Christ? Oh, God. You know, have you ever felt like a failure? Or are you feeling like a failure right now? Well, there's no way you can meet the requirements of perfection set up, you know, set up by human, human beings. Jesus has already met all those requirements. And, this is, you know, and we feel this failure simply because we know we just can't measure up. We just can't perform enough. And we just can't do enough. Folks, listen to me. Let me put out the truth here. The bottom line is we're all hypocrites. We all fail in our walk with Jesus. All Christians everywhere are hypocrites. That's a Debbie Downer, isn't it? (laughs) Why don't we just admit it? We say we need to pray more, but we don't. Right, church? We say we need to spend more time in the Word, but we don't. We say we need to serve more, but we don't. We say we will tithe to the church sometime, but we don't. And let's be honest, if our talk doesn't match our walk or our walk doesn't match our talk, then you are a hypocrite. Sorry to be a killjoy, but it's just true. Just admit it. You are no more perfect than I am. I am no more perfect than you are. Maybe even less. If we can come to that reality, and if we can understand, you know, really, if you think about it, boy, you know, we, if we could rename our church, we'd be the first church of hypocrites. How many people do you think would come? How many people would think you'd come? You put out your church sign. First church of hypocrites. I bet you it would be filled. Because we're being honest about who we are in Christ. Or Eastview Wesleyan hypocrites, College Wesleyan hypocrites. They're there too, not just here. And they're at Lakeview too. They're even a part of the Billy Graham Association. (laughs) I think more people would probably come because we are being honest about we try we try so hard and we fail so often and when you fail you're saying you love Jesus and you're going to give him all your heart mind and soul how many of you have actually done that i don't think many of you have and so why don't we just admit it i am a hypocrite you're a hypocrite and let's go follow Jesus together instead of constantly looking at each other comparing ourselves to other people Thinking, man, that got it going on. Man, they really love Jesus. You know, they don't do anything wrong. At least we don't see. There was a girl in our church who thought my family, not this family, but my South family in the church was the perfect family. She had this grand illusion that our family was perfect. And that she couldn't measure up. Well, if you come in, if you came into my family, <laughs> you would find out we're just as messed up as everybody else. My mom nagged my dad. My dad was pretty close to perfect. <laughs> he even he didn't do it perfectly. I used to steal from my brothers and sisters. You know, to go buy candy at the pink store. My sister used to rob them. You know, those of you in the Church of God, you know, the pennies for missions. She used to go and steal from my mom, roll them up, and take them to the store. My brother Jim used to steal from my brother John. 
The only holy one was my brother Chuck, I think. You know? Because when you get behind the closed doors, yeah, my family loved Jesus. We did. All of my brothers and sisters are Christians. They love Jesus. Serving in the church somewhere, in the community somewhere. You know, my mom and dad were the, the greatest parents ever, but they were by no means perfect. And when you get by, when this particular young lady got behind our closed doors, she found out that we were just as messed up as her family. And I'll never forget the pastor I worked with for 12 years. I thought he was the holiest man that walked the earth. And I had a great admiration for him. And um, just, you know, he was, he let me keep my job when he should have fired me. Let me just be honest. And then uh, he shared this story about when he went to Walmart looking for a certain kind of screw. Well, he found the screw he needed in a package that had the whole parts assembly that he was replacing but he didn't need the whole parts he just needed the screw he opened the package up neatly took the screw and put the package back on the hanger and walked out of the store when i heard his story i could remember thinking no way you can't you couldn't have done that you're the most holy man But he did. He walked out with it. And he used the screw and he never took it back. He never paid for it. But he confessed that morning how not holy he was. Folks, all of us have been the hypocrites at some point on our journey. And what I learned from another guy, pastor, older pastor friend of mine, is when you turn 80, you stop being a hypocrite. Because I'm told that once you get past the Get past 80, you know everything. <laughs> Am I right, people who are over 80? Yeah. Well, Martha, you've shown me the light, so don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did. I know plenty of Christians who beat themselves up daily because they can't measure up or can't do enough, or don't pray enough, or don't read their Bible enough. I know Christians and folks that's just as sinful as those who choose not to follow Jesus. Because what you're saying is that God didn't do enough by sending his one and only son to die on a cross to tell you how special you are and how much you are loved. And he's got to do something else to prove it. That's just as sinful as those who choose not to follow Christ. It's called a false humility. And, and I call it constipated Christianity. You know, those people are always grumpy. They never experience joy. They're so worried about their own sin or, or they're worried about somebody, everybody else's sin that they can't enjoy life. They're always under conviction and hardly ever experience the joy of the Lord. Who wants to be around spiritually constipated, grumpy, joyless Christians? Hey, sign me up. Aren't those the people we avoid? I do. These kinds of people would do God a favor, but not advertising that they are Christian. <laughs> they need to take the bumper stickers off their car and take that fish off that says how much they love Jesus. But this doesn't mean we're not worthy of being Christ followers, folks. It really doesn't mean that we're not worthy of being Christ followers. It simply means we need to be honest about who we are and realize that Jesus went to the cross and died for that, and we no longer have to be a slave to it. God's still going to love you if you're grumpy and spiritually constipated. He's not going to stop loving you. But it doesn't mean we're not, you're not worthy of being a Christ follower. Simply be honest about it and realize he went to the cross for you and you don't have to be a slave to it. Romans 6, 6 says, we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might 
lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slave to sin. God knew the people of Israel would never keep the whole law. That's why he instituted an elaborate system of sacrifices from the beginning, very beginning. Do you know they had sacrifices for sins they didn't even know they committed yet? Wow! When Jesus came, when they brought, when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus in, Jesus in, they had to bring in a, buy a dove or a pigeon or something, a pigeon. That's all they could afford to offer a sacrifice for their newborn son. God knew Israel couldn't keep the whole law. The law was not meant, and this is, this is where the Pharisees got it wrong. The law was not meant to perfect people. The law was meant just to lead them back to God. And if we're honest, if we're honest, we know deep down that we can't measure up, don't we? If we're honest, we know deep down that we can't do enough to please God. If we're honest, we know deep down we can't work hard enough for God. We know that. And what he is wanting, he's wanting us to come to the end of ourselves so we can discover the grace that he freely offers through Jesus. It took me eight years to figure that out. It took me eight years to get to that point, to die to myself. And I've discovered the grace that he offers freely through Jesus is the best thing. Now, I mess up. I say the wrong thing. I do the wrong thing. I make the wrong decisions. And when I confess those, I know I'm forgiven too. He's wanting us to come to an end of ourselves so we can discover the grace that he freely offers through Jesus. On the flip side, God knew they would never measure up. God knew we would try to please him. God knew we would try to work hard. That's why he gave us forgiveness, compassion, and mercy because those things lead us back to him. And when we put our faith in him, folks, when we put our faith in him, when you confess Jesus as Lord of your life, as you enter into relationship with him, you put your faith in him, you are made righteous, and you will be no more righteous in 20 years than the first day you put your faith in him. You will be no more righteous. In 20 years, then in that moment, you gave your life to Christ and said, Jesus, come in, take my life. You will not become more righteous. You can't do anything else to become more righteous. Oh, but we sure try, don't we? We keep doing this and trying harder. When he says, come to me and rest, when am I going to be enough for you? We look at other Christians who have failed and say, I'm more righteous than they are. We don't say the words. But we get this little haughtiness that happens up inside of us. You know it. We say something like, man, I'm glad I'm not like they are. Man, I'm glad I'm not going through those things they're going through. Well, I'm glad I didn't make that mistake. You know. We look at other Christians who are doing things we disagree with and say, boy, I'm glad I'm not like them. The end result of this kind of righteousness is that we become self-righteous. Or I like to say spiritually constipated. Your your faith journey, if if you're on it, if you have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior alive, you've asked him into your heart, you confess him as Lord, 
You know, your, your faith journey is about growing from the inside out. In other words, as you follow Jesus, you become selfless. As you, as you follow Jesus, the things of this earth grow strangely dim. dim. As you follow Jesus... You know, you find rest. And John 3, 30 reminds us that he must become greater. And we must become less. And folks, that's the journey of anybody who says they follow Jesus. And God is simply wanting us to become obsessed with his son, obsessed to the point we don't need anything else. We get obsessed with our football teams. We get obsessed with our houses and our cars, and we get obsessed with money, and we get obsessed with all of these things. God is saying, <laughs> you will find rest with my son. Be obsessed with him. Because when we're obsessed with him, the scripture says he's going to take all of those things, those detailed things that we make, spend so much time worrying and wearing ourselves out. He says, I will give you rest. I will make your life easier. Be obsessed with me, and I will let you know what your needs really are. Because you don't know my situation. Hello. He knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly what you're going through. He knows exactly what's going to happen. And he knows if you are obedient, he can do some incredible stuff in your life. Or you can be this joyless, grumpy, spiritually constipated, God, what are you going to do for me now, Christian? And if that's you, you really do need to confess. God's saying, don't be obsessed with perfecting yourself. Don't be obsessed with trying to measure up. Don't be obsessed with doing, you think you need to do more. You know, and as soon as we do more, God will love us more. He's saying, be obsessed with my son who comes to give you rest. Folks, you never become more righteous than you are today. All Jesus wants to do is to become greater in your life. Do you want that? Oh, yes, pastor, I want it. Hypocrite. No, you don't. No, you don't. Well, that's mean, pastor. Yeah, I've lived that lie. I've said those words. But they weren't true. Say the words with your lips all you want. But until you desire him to become greater in you, until he becomes enough for you, they're just empty words. God's calling us to be honest, folks. Do a spiritual checkup right now. Are you really? Do you really follow him? Or is it like little Danny's Jesus? <laughs> that he made up who he think Jesus was. Because all of us in here, like I said, we have this idea of who Jesus is. 
probably 80% of what you're thinking is not true. I can't prove it, but our lives reflect it. So I'm asking you, is Jesus enough for you? Is he enough for you? And to answer it honestly, if he's not, say no. Because that's when the Holy Spirit can begin to work. A lot of times, you know, we do that and we say, oh, yes, Jesus, you're enough for me. When in reality, we should say, no, you're not enough. You're not enough. Forgive me. Do you hear the difference? God, I want you to become greater, but there's just so much other stuff in my life. Jesus has come to me. And like a little kid comes to their dad when they're scared. That's all the kids know how to do. And when they come to their dad, they find comfort and peace, and their dad holds them close. And they experience something incredible. Wow, we need to become like children in that sense. Daddy, I am scared. Daddy, I don't really know what it means to follow you. Daddy, I know you're enough, but, you know, I want three or four other dads too. (laughs) Just to come before him and to be honest. That's when God can begin to work.